So after our opening and keynote speech, we're now going to move on to session two, which is weighing evidence and assessing uncertainties for scientific advice. And then after coffee, we move on to future challenges and then on to lunch. So uh, the beginning of the weighing evidence session, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Harvey Clarewell from the Hamner Institutes um, in the US. And he's going to tell us about weighing evidence of biological relevance from empirical testing to rat in rats from last century to 21st century mode of action analysis. So I'm really looking forward to this. So thank you very much. Please go ahead. Thank you, Derek. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for allowing me to come to uh, Milan at this time. And uh, I uh, will be following in the uh, footsteps of my uh, predecessor at the podium. Lawrence has uh, done much to uh, contribute to the development of mode of action concepts and the use, their uses in risk assessment over the years. The, um, uh, the main thing that you notice working in toxicology and risk assessment is how many diverse opinions there are. And so uh, even the question of why are, what are we doing, why are we doing it, can sometimes be troub troubling and problematic to get agreement on. But let's, let's just uh, agree for the moment uh, that what we're trying to do is get the necessary information about chemicals to safeguard human environmental health. I think we can agree on that. And, and that does require appropriate test systems, whether animal or in vitro or in silico, and robust interpretive tools to be able to relate those to the exposures of concern, which is the humans or species, other species in the environment. Um, this whole discipline started to some extent, uh, officially anyway, in the US uh, in the uh, uh, 1970s in the uh, or in the early 1900s, uh, when uh, uh, the U.S. FDA was created, and and Harvey Wiley, a namesake of whom I'm a namesake, uh, uh, was uh, started the Poison Squad. Uh, at the time, there was a lot of snake oil elixirs being uh, marketed around the U.S. without any control, and uh, uh, they began actually by trying them themselves and seeing if they saw any ill effects. So uh, that's, that's a dedicated public servant, I must say. And uh, uh, this was written up uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, in, this, in a journal, and there's actually a, a song that was written about the Poison Squad. Uh, but so a, a key question about this business of uh, uh, toxicology and risk assessment is what do we really need to know? Because that really determines what kind of uh, judgments we make, what kinds of studies are used. Uh, is it any possibility of response? Are you just interested in labeling a chemical or uh, categorizing it? I do, uh, the asterisk points out that that does actually stand in opposition to the wisdom of Paracelsus, that all things are poisons and uh, none of them is, with, is uh, free of being a poison except the dose differentiates the two. But if you, uh, uh, the, on the alternative, really want to know what's the likelihood of seeing a response at a given dose, a human relevant environmental dose, that's risk assessment, that's a much harder question and it requires much more information. And in, in recent years, there's been a push to have a third consideration, uh, which is in, in a form of triage, a, a screening uh, approach would be just, is there no reasonable likelihood of response at the anticipated exposures? And so that's why today, most risk assessment, new risk assessment frameworks begin with an exposure assessment and look at things like a threshold for toxic TTC. Tox toxicological concern, thank you. Um, and so th particularly as we move towards the use of in vitro assays, the, the initial uses are likely to be in terms of ruling out or triaging chemicals for which the margin of exposure appears to be so great that further testing isn't needed uh, based on their inter interaction of the chemical with cellular assays. There's a very nice quote that the uh, National Research Council uh, uh, produced in Science and Judgment and Risk Assessment. The quality of risk analysis will improve as the quality of input improves. As we learn more about biology, chemistry, physics, and demography, we can make progressively better assessments of the risks involved. Risk assessment evolves continually with reevaluation as the new models and data become available. 
I've been part of that process now for 30 some odd years and have really been pleased by the amount of change that has occurred in going from an essentially uh, box checking discipline to one that really significantly considers uh, mode of action and, and uh, biological information. And it's really the, uh, ev the revolution in biology with molecular biology uh, in particular, that has driven the, the, the uh, thought that we can move on to looking at cellular level effects and, in, and being able to extrapolate those to uh, estimates of in vivo risk. So I will, uh, just as my predecessor on the podium, kind of be using mostly examples from EPA, US EPA because I've been working I don't work at EPA, but I've been working with EPA scientists for, uh, for uh, three decades. And so I'm more familiar with their examples. But these kinds of things are, are going on around the world. And I will mention that most of them are subject of, uh, of uh, IPCS who uh, harmonization uh, efforts, successful uh, efforts. Uh, but uh, in its day, back in the 90s, when, it was, when they were proposed, the new EPA cancer guidelines were somewhat revolutionary, and I credit Bill Farland primarily uh, when he was head of NCEA at EPA with uh, moving this process forward. And they redefined default as a generic approach, the use of which must be justified on the basis of the lack of adequate chemical-specific data. Now that's quite a change from this is the way you'll do it unless you can provide evidence otherwise. And it is still, I would say, something which we have not very many examples of there uh, being uh, an assessment of sufficient evidence, but the concept of it being a default approach being generic and having to be justified is extremely important. And uh, the, the, that EPA cancer guideline draft in, the 90, in 94 actually coined the term mode of action, which now we use as a household term. But before that, people used the word mechanism, which was a terrible thing to do when you're a scientist because everybody knows a mechanism is something you can build a career on. But the mode of action is something that a risk assessor can use now, here and now, if they know enough to be able to support a decision in a risk assessment. And so it's defined in the EPA guidelines as a sequence of key events and processes, starting with interaction of an agent with a cell, proceeding through operational and anatomical changes and resulting in cancer, in this case, formation. And that's been broadened now to be both cancer and non-cancer effects. They also defined a biologically based dose response model for the first time. The idea that you could actually hope to be able to predict not only kinetics but also f dynamics of the interaction of a chemical with a uh, biological system. And th so 20 years later, we are now actually developing methods to do this. We call them computational systems biology models, but they, when you link those to pharmacokinetic models, what you are building is a biologically based dose response model. So that's remarkable progress, I would say. So mechanistic data is, has become more and more crucial and more and more expected to be used in risk assessment. It can help you to identify what are the key biological events, which we then can call precursors, th things that if you have this happen, then you will likely see the adverse outcome of concern. They are the base, the mechanistic data is really the basis for assessing human relevance. And of deciding whether something is likely to be a uh, low-dose linear carcinogen or one that has an effective threshold. Uh, it also, the, knowing uh, the uh, mechanism or the mode of action uh, allows you to anticipate whether something is likely to have specific windows of susceptibility d at different life stages. It's also uh, a key, for example, with phthalates. It's understanding the, the mode of action of phthalate toxicity that allows us to be able to group all the phthalates together in order to do a cumulative risk assessment. And it also helps us to select what's the biomarker that should be used, uh, inhibition of testosterone. Otherwise, we'd, uh, the, the in vivo data is at huge doses where the, uh, the effects are actually life-threatening, not the subtle effects on on the uh, uh, sexual development, which has only been studied in one or two of the many phthalates. So th that's another uh, uh, value of this kind of data. And 
you, it can also promote the use of, uh, of uh, harmonized approaches for different endpoints. Uh, an example of this is perchlorate. We're identifying the fact that inhibition of, of iodine uptake by the thyroid underlies both the, the cancer and non-cancer outcomes that were observed in multi-generation studies. So that a single harmonized risk assessment could be performed on that basis rather than having separate ones for cancer and for non-cancer effects. The mode of action work really started in the 70s and perhaps even even earlier. Uh, uh, Gehring and Watanabe at Dow Chemical were doing studies showing that the reason vinyl chloride's uh, um, uh, epidemiological uh, evidence of cancer appeared to plateau at higher concentrations was because it was mediated by the production of a reactive metabolite, an epoxide, chloroepoxide and that saturation of metabolism meant that as you went to higher concentrations of vinyl chloride, you didn't go to higher concentrations of the reactive metabolite. So that was some of the early mode of action uh, data that actually drove acceptance of what, what uh, is called physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling. Um, uh, around the uh, 1980s, uh, Sam Cohen uh, 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 got a lot of well-deserved uh, 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 visibility uh, for uh, uh, standing up to the uh, convention and saying that the bladder tumors uh, produced by saccharin were not a strictly mutagenic carcinogenicity. In fact, they were a, a secondary to uh, crystal formation in the in the uh, uh, bladder, and that uh, it was a threshold phenomenon. And he had a great deal of resistance from the establishment uh, for that, uh, but he he has stood the test of time. And uh, I noted that uh, his uh, paper on the human relevance uh, uh, is uh, one of the ones that was just uh, cited. Um, uh, the, for years, the Chemical Industry Institute of Tox Toxicology, which is now the Hamner Institutes for Health Sciences, uh, did uh, uh, research to uh, uh, characterize the uh, uh, production of nasal tumors in rats by formaldehyde. And, uh, developed the first biologically based dose response model, which has been used in some company, uh, countries now to inform the dose response for tumors in humans. And uh, many, many different locations did work over the, uh, uh, particularly in the 1980s, on hydrocarbon nephropathy, which was a male rat specific effect of alpha 2U globulin accumulation in the, in the uh, kidney. And of course, the dioxin story, goes on and on. If there's any chemical that's been overstudied on mode of action with no uh, great uh, uh, conclusions, uh, that's it. And uh, I am uh, happy to be part of the arsenic story now because arsenic is another chemical I trust I'll be able to work on for years to come because it's an important public health concern and a, a, a very, very uh, excellent puzzle. That's what I live for. But uh, so, the, all of these kinds of efforts were crystallized into a mode of action framework which, as I say, began to a large extent with the EPA cancer guidelines but was then formalized, generalized, and harmonized by the IPCS uh, where you uh, uh, postulate your mode of action, identify a sequence of key events from the chemical interacting with some protein or other element in the cell all the way to the formation of a tumor. Uh, or other uh, adverse outcome, and then garnish, uh, then garner experimental support, and also any contradictory uh, evidence. Uh, look at uh, all of this Bradford Hill type uh, uh, um, uh, concerns, and uh, identify uncertainties. That was extended then, or followed on perhaps is a better way to put it, by an, an effort that began at ILSI and uh, then again was uh, harmonized and generalized by the IPCS into a human relevance framework which looks specifically at the concordance of, of key events and relevant biology between laboratory species and humans and uh, it, they extended the uh, analysis to include non-cancer endpoints as well. And then, uh, so the, the main considerations are the, are the weight of evidence analysis, the, the, are the key events plausible, and, uh, is, and in the bottom line, is the animal mode of action plausible in humans considering the differences in dose, differences in species, uh, and uh, then coming to a conclusion. Um, and then more recently, 
I don't really remember when these first started, when the train started running. This is, boy, this one took, left the terminal quickly with a lot of energy. Uh, once an AOP was uh, defined, everybody has jumped on this train. Uh, but it's important to understand that really the adverse outcome pathway is derived from the mode of action concept. And the most important distinction is that an adverse outcome pathway is chemical agnostic. And, oh wow. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so it has to uh, uh, be relevant for anything that disturbs or perturbs the molecular target, this, uh, the same molecular target, sufficiently to produce the uh, adverse outcome, whereas the mode of action also considers metabolism and dose response of the chemical exposure. Um, and so putting it together then, mode of action directs both decisions uh, regarding what approach we should use and also the application of tools. It's absolutely necessary to know whether the chemical or one of its metabolites produces the effect in order to be able to do pharmacokinetic modeling to, uh, to, to do dosimetry. You have to do dosimetry on the right dose metric. And, uh, there have been a number of uh, examples, uh, uh, alichlor, uh, chloroform, cacodylic acid, that's dimethyl arsenic, uh, um, have all had uh, uh, either margin of exposure or nonlinear approaches approved based on their mode of action information. Other applications are uh, determination of human relevance for atrazine, cross chemical extrapolation, IR uh, called vinyl fluoride, a known human carcinogen by analogy to vinyl chloride. The uh, um, uh, organophosphate cumulative risk assessment, um, the, um, uh, I mentioned uh, perchlorate and vinyl chloride, and uh, development of chemical specific uh, uh, adjustment factors. The important thing to remember is that as you bring in more information on a chemical, you change the nature of uncertainty. And it makes people feel like there's more uncertainty because now they're worried about the parameters in the PVPK model or b about the evidence for a particular uh, in vitro assay and how it's relevant to the in vivo consideration. And what we're doing in truth is trading off uncertainty. We're increasing, we're, we're increasing quantifiable uncertainty, visible uncertainty, uncertainty associated with a model or with a particular assay or disagreement between different experiments but we're decreasing non-quantifiable uncertainty. We are going from a default where we have no idea how bad we're off to something that's informed by evidence and we are starting to know how uncertain it is. But that doesn't mean the original way was without uncertainty, it was just unknown uncertainty, which is the worst form. And there are methods that I won't go into for, for actually trying to categorize what I, what I prefer to think of this as, as opposed to expert elicitation is to think of it as, as uh, transparent characterization of decisions. And so if you have, in, in the case of the methylene chloride uh, risk assessment, a series of decisions that have to be made, which bi uh, bioassay, whether to use the uh, PBBK model or, or applied dose for the uh, uh, animal to uh, human extrapolation and what to use as the approach in the human. So you have qualitative decisions and quantitative aspects, you can put them together into a decision tree. And this can be used for expert elicitation, but what I used it for here was to characterize what was the decision by regulatory agencies. They document what they've done, and by, uh, you can see actually on this that it's actually a decision that has made the difference. This is dating back to the uh, uh, 90s. Uh, uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, the original EPA value, the FDA's uh, value, uh, and the, the revised EPA value, and what the airports had proposed. All of these values can be uh, characterized by a decision in this tree whether to use or not use a new technology. At that time, it was PBPK modeling. And what you can do is you can actually then characterize what's the distribution of risk estimates using the different decision logic. So that you're trying to quantify now the impact of decisions on the result of the uh, risk assessment. And you can uh, show, for example, that the, actually the, the uh, dis which are the most weighty decisions. In this case, the deciding which pathway was toxic was the most important uh, decision in determining what the uh, risk outcome would be. And then one can actually characterize again 
transparently what the decision of the uh, regulators was compared to what the science might say. And so uh, this shows the distribution of, of virtually safe concentrations for different outcomes, uh, cancer outcomes for trichloroethylene. And the, the width of the line uh, shows the, uh, um, the, in this case it would be the, the regulators making the decision, what was their belief that, that the scientific evidence supported. And uh, the dashed line being least evidence and the thick line being the, the most evidence. But then they could then bring in public health protective policy and say, but we're going to use the linear uh, value in the uh, liver or the uh, linear value in the lung to be public health protective. And uh, uh, just to let you know that this is continuing to progress, this whole use of mechanistic information. And I highly recommend a, a paper by Rusty Thomas, who uh, was at the Hamner at the time, but is now at the EPA's uh, uh, National Center for Computational Toxicology. It came out in Tox Sci in 2013. And uh, it, it describes a tiered approach for 21st century risk evaluation that begins with the high throughput or in vitro genomic screening, identifies chemicals that have selective uh, toxicity rather than non-selective, and then has a, a series of, of, of follow-up steps that at some point include in vivo uh, assays uh, as, a, as a function of what the initial results are. And so this kind of a tiered approach uh, triage is, I'm sure, necessary to be able to look at large numbers of chemicals in the future. And uh, uh, so with that, I'll close. Okay, anything. <laughs> Many thanks for that uh, excellent presentation. Now we've got time for, we'll ha allow one question, burning question on a technical issue, because we've got plenty of time for discussion at the end on the more general issues. Oh, there's one at the back, one at the back, please. Microphones. Thank you. Oh, no, there's two. Oh, he's over there at the back. On, on my right. Yeah. Thank you. Abdul Afghan from uh, Health Canada. As a risk assessor, um, when I was studying toxicology in school, it used to be the other way around. You'd start with the animal and then you'd go to the mode of action for your in vitro stuff. Now I feel like we're flipping the script, so we start with in vitro and then we'll go to the animal. But what we're missing is that going straight to the in vitro, you're not taking into consideration the toxicokinetics, which you had talked about with the PBPK modeling, you'd do that, and then you could go into the in vitro testing, which would be great. But in order to get a really good PBPK model, you have to have good in vivo data. So your model's only as good as your data. So you still need the in vivo data. Um, I, the integrated testing that was kind of described yesterday by the NTP, I kind of like that. You have the short-term uh, animal testing with all the omics and stuff and all the new uh, effect measurement techniques that you have and then you can go into the in vitro later and then try to get some sort of dose from there, like a more usable data. With the in vitro up front, from a screening level risk assessment perspective, when you don't have all the data in the background and it's a new chemical, it really limits your ability to use the data and therefore make a judgment. Um, can you comment on flipping the script and whether that's the right way to do it or not or maybe a mixed approach where you're having maybe shorter term in vivo data supported by in vitro data and then using all the omics that we have, all the new measurement techniques? Uh, that's an excellent question. I think um, I, I would recommend to you the papers by Barbara Wetmore of the Hamner. Uh, uh, Rusty Thomas and I were uh, also uh, associated with those papers. What it was was a study by the Hamner uh, doing dose uh, metabolism and uh, plasma binding assays on the chemicals in the ToxCast assays for the first uh, set of chemicals that were uh, uh, analyzed by the National Center for Computational Toxicology. And uh, we were able to show that we could do a good job of uh, in vitro to in vivo extrapolation of those uh, in vitro assay results, bioactive concentrations, by uh, using uh, 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 some fairly s simple concepts from pharma. Uh, for predicting uh, the in vivo clearance. And uh, that, ha that has uh, been moving along very nicely. And so I, I think that we are actually in a position to be able to estimate 
points of departure in the human f uh, for uh, uh, daily exposure rates that are equivalent, that would produce a blood level equivalent to the concentrations in the media and the in vitro assays. And that's the direction that, that we are going now, and also EPA and NIEHS. Um, and uh, there's also very strong support for that in, in Europe, Bas Blabor and others at the University of Utrecht. So I do believe we are flipping the switch, and I believe it's the right thing to do. Okay, many thanks. Um, so, can I just remind everybody about the Twitter hashtag? So, while you're going down, we thank you for your presentation. Remind us.